I really don't know how many of you have heard me speak recently, so I hope I'm not repeating my stories too often. <laughs> you want to hear some of that again? <laughs> In Penang! In Penang, not too long ago, during Chinese New Year, our Prime Minister was so afraid that us Chinese votes are going to abandon Manisan National in droves. They are so afraid that maybe up to 80 over percent of the Chinese will desert Barisan National, causing Barisan National to lose in Putrajaya. So Najib pulled out an ace from his lips. He invited Sai to come and perform for us. He invited Sai to come and perform for us during Chinese New Year on the second big day of Chinese New Year in Penang. When we got the news uh, that Sai is coming up, uh, we were like, how are they there? They got money, they can buy Sai on. <laughs> but what happened that day? Instead, it became a complete U-turn to what, what was supposed to be a victory cry by Najib. It was a complete disaster for BN, but what is worse, it was a complete embarrassment for us Malaysians. I don't know how many of you have watched YouTube. Not the no, no, no one. The other one. The one where our Prime Minister was made to wait on the stage. Wait. Wait, wait some more. The MC is screaming on top of her life. But if we can bring the pukul yang paling gemuruh kepada saya untuk naik atas pentas, gongsan bersama perdana menteri kita yang amat dicintai dan dihormati oleh rakyat Indonesia. Kepala lagi. Oh saya. Najib Lao Tsai Refuses to come up Mari kita berikan tepukan sekali lagi Minta Tsai naik atas pentas Refuses to come up for 6 whole minutes The Prime Minister of the country was made to wait For a superstar to come up and low Tsai with him Even when the workers came on stage and took away the low Tsai in the United States, in the United Kingdom, when they have elections, it is normal for superstars to be on stage to help promote the candidate. But what happens in these places is that the superstar will come on stage and announce, let us welcome to the stage the presidential nominee for the United States of America, President Barack Obama. Here, the Prime Minister is waiting for the artist to come out and stand with him. Why are we so fascinated with South Korea at the moment? 
Many of you on TV at home, turn on Astro while you're watching Korean dramas. When you go to movie, you may watch Korean movies. My, one of my favorite movies till this day was this movie, My Sassy Girl. Of course, the girl being very pretty helps, but My Sassy Girl. We are listening to Korean songs, and we do not even know a single word of Korean. And yet, we are so fascinated with that country. But it comes with a whole other suite of things besides music and entertainment that we are fascinated with Korea. Korea produces one of the best cars in the world today, Hyundai. Yeah, he should also got this of Proton. Ah, going to play play, we had Proton. In 1999, Hyundai was selling 900,000 units of Hyundai throughout the world. In Malaysia, Proton was selling globally 180,000 units. One fifth of Hyundai. Never mind, we just started, we need to catch up. 180,000 units. So after 12 years, in 2011, how many protons did we sell globally? We improved. Barisan National told us we improved. We should be proud. We sold 200,000 units of proton in 2011. An improvement of 20,000 units. We look at Hyundai. From 1999 to 2011, how many Hyundai did they increase in sales? From 900,000 units, they sold 6.6 million units, an increase of 5.7 million units. We saw increase of how much? 20,000 units. In 1999, Proton was ranked 25th in the world. Not bad lah for a fairly new car company. You know? 2011, we were ranked number 38. Dropped from 25th to 38. In 1999, Hyundai was ranked number 13th in the world. Already quite advanced. But today, 2011 till today, they are ranked number 4 in the world. One of the big car power, auto powers in the world today. Not just cars, electronics. Electronics, you look at Chinese New Year, many of you bought new TV, right? Now TV very fancy. You go to all those TV stores, huh? you can start looking at all the TV screens, your, your fucking door, huh? Lao Chui, huh? Uh, not, not only you don't have to use your press button to change channel, you don't have to use remote, you snap your fingers also can change channel. You want to play Angry Bird on iPhone very small, right? you somehow have to drag and push, drag and let go, drag and let go. Now Angry Bird, you just throw like that energy on TV. You find your computer screen too small, you want a big screen, your Samsung is fully connected to the internet, world core processor, everything inside the TV. It's very advanced, it's through innovation they get to where they are today. So you walk into an electronic store, you look at the row of TVs on your left, it is Samsung TVs. You look at the TVs on your right, it is LG TVs. LG, uh, I think it's uh, used to stand for look good or something like that. LG TVs. LG TVs are now the number two hottest selling television company in the world. They sell the second highest number of television sets in the entire world. Who sells number one? Samsung. So number two, LG from which country? South Korea. Last time called Gold Star, yes. Lucky Gold Star, yes. Ah. On the right, Samsung. How many TVs did they sell? They sold the most number of TVs in the world. Where are they from? South Korea. Last time I remember in the 80s, we used to watch what? Sanyo, Shark. In the 90s, we used to watch what? Uh, Sony, Hitachi, Toshiba. In the 2000s, maybe more Sony, National Panasonic. Today, we are watching Samsung, we are watching LG. No longer the Japanese brands. Samsung, what else? Your handphone, if they are not holding an iPhone from US, they are holding a Samsung from South Korea. Generally. Okay. Samsung Electronics alone, global sales. Don't talk about Samsung Construction, Samsung Property, and all sorts of other Samsung companies in Korea. Ignore all those. Just Samsung Electronics. Global revenue. One year, 2012. 550 billion ringgit. Revenue, 550 billion ringgit. Now, how big is 550 billion ringgit? In Malaysia, you will hear this from all the opposition politicians. You will see this in all our campaign materials. Malaysia's debt is rising. 
every year the government uh, creates a budget deficit even though revenue increased by leaps and bounds. Every year they spend more than they have, they take a lot more loans than they need to. As a result, today's Malaysia's debt is 502 billion or 53% of our GDP. Any higher than that, it becomes a little bit dangerous for our economy already. And that doesn't yet include all the hidden debts in our system, something I'll talk about another day. 502 billion means what? Every single one of you here, doesn't matter whether you're 80 years old or you are 3 years old, you have a debt on top of your head amounting to 17,000 ringgit. 17,000 ringgit which your future generations is going to pay for you because the debt is being incurred today. 502 billion ringgit when you compare with Samsung's revenue. One year Samsung revenue is able to wipe out the entire debt of this country within a year. That is how big Samsung has become. We are no longer comparing ourselves with a country. We are comparing ourselves with a subsidiary company of Samsung in South Korea. How did this happen? How the heck did this happen when Pakistan National tells us every single year our economy is doing so well? We should be grateful to the achievements of Pakistan National. MCA tells us we must can earn. Can earn. Okay? To Pakistan National. They tell us we grew. Of course we grew. Just like Proton, we increase our sales. But compared to other companies, we are falling far behind. And the main reason why we are falling far behind is only one reason. And one reason that I'm sure very close to every single one of your hearts here. Education. Education is the source of a vibrant economy. The weaker your education system is, the weaker your economy. And our, our ministers keep telling us we have one of the best education systems in the world. They tell us that our students every year is turning up more and more age, so they're getting smarter and smarter. But are they really getting smarter? Are they really getting smarter or is the government just cheating us? We have an objective test. Very simple, two tests across all countries. And there are a few organizations that do that today. Trends in International Maths and Science Studies. Okay? It is a study that goes across 64 countries in the world, nearly the whole world already. All the world that matters. With the collaboration of the Ministry of Education locally. That means it's not some secret foreign Jewish organization coming into Malaysia, finds out without want to screw Malaysia. No. It is done with complete access and collaboration and cooperation from the Ministry of Malaysia. And they published their latest findings for 2011 last year in December. And the findings said that Malaysia was number one. Not number one for maths, not number one for science. Okay, not that we got the highest marks, no. They found that we were number one in terms of since 1999 when they first started the study. When Malaysia first participated in the study, 1999, 2003, 2007, 2011, it was Malaysia that suffered the biggest drop in mathematics result for the past 12 years. Largest. And for science, same thing. Our marks dropped the most among all countries in the world from 1999 to 2011. One subject could be coincidence. Two subjects is definitely not coincidence. It is the fact that our education system is really going down the drain. In, 2000, uh, in 2003, our maths was still quite respectable. We achieved number 12 in the world among all the 64 countries. Today, we are number 26. For, math, for science, we were number 20 then. Today, we are number 32. You may say, hey, 26, 32, still somewhere in the middle, uh, total 64 country, why are you worry so much? <laughs> if in 12 years we can slide so much, in another 12 years you want to wait until we are 50 something, 60 something, then you think about changing that. <laughs> it's going to go down all the way. If we don't stop the rot, the people who will suffer the most is not us. It is our children who are going through the education system right now. No, last time uh, when I get A uh, for my result, I tell Papa, Papa, I got A. Papa will ask me and look at me. You copied your friend paper. <laughs> now my daughter can 
and say, Papa, Papa, I got A. I look at it. Did the government cheat her? <laughs> it is this case because our government is telling us, and Muin said this on stage, uh, I'm not creating some stories or anything. Muin, our Deputy Prime Minister, our Education Minister said this on stage at an international conference. Malaysia's education system is now better than US, UK and Germany. He said it with a straight face there. He wasn't joking. <laughs> but I want to ask, if our education system is so good, why are our ministers, as Nuru Iza said just now, why are our ministers sending all their children overseas to study? If our universities, our schools are so good, send them to the local schools, send them to the local universities. Why are they going overseas? So obviously our ministers are lying to the people because they are politicizing education. They are only interested in presenting fanciful results. They don't really care whether the quality deteriorates or not. They don't care at all. They just want the people to think that they are having good education, but in reality, they don't care if the quality has actually dropped. Now compare that again now with South Korea. South Korea. How is it in South Korea that they achieve so much? Education. The very same study, the very same study in teams, South Korea now is number three in the world for science. South Korea now is number one in the world for mathematics. So they did not get to where they are by fluke or by chance, but by having a quality education system. And what is the result? The result is Malaysia's economy falling far behind the rest. In 1961, after we were independent for a few years, we were still very rich relative to our neighbors. At that point in time, our per capita income was 282 US dollars per person. At that point in time, South Korea was only 91 US dollars per person. To put it very simply, kita makan tiga mangkuk nasi, di orang kat Korea Selatan tak sampai satu mangkuk. Masih lapar, kita dah kenyang penuh-penuh, dia orang tak sampai satu makhluk. Hari ini dah tak sama. Dah terbalik dah sekali lagi. Korea Selatan sekarang makan dua mangkuk, kita makan tak sampai satu mangkuk. The Koreans now have an average per capita income of 22,400 US dollars. Malaysians today, as our Barisan National proudly tells you, we have increased from 282 US in 1961 to 9,900 US dollars in 2011. Oh, we should be grateful. But they don't tell me that other people have gone so much more ahead of us. We are losing out to our neighbors, we are losing out to competitors, and if we don't continue to catch up, we will soon lose out to Thailand, Indonesia, or maybe even Cambodia. And that is the reason why we must change this rotten government. They are stealing our money. Money, never mind. Money, we steal our money. I work two more hours, I earn back the money. Take my family. They steal our land. Never mind. We work harder, we buy more land to plant our trees, to plant our uh, crops. But they are also stealing our children's education. And when they steal our children's education, you cannot take it back. You cannot send your kid back to school for six years primary school. You cannot send your kids back to six years of secondary school. You don't want to send your child back to the same three years, same course in the same university. You cannot do that. So what the government is stealing from our children today is irreparable. And it is to me the biggest sin from the Barisan National Government. Destroying our education system. Now when everything falls, when everything falls apart, when everything rocks, then you find that not only the economy or the education is affected, everything else gets affected, our badminton gets affected, our football gets affected. Nobody watches our football team today. Yeah. Yeah. But last time, for the older folks around, you may remember Mokta Dahari. Yeah. Uh, you may remember Hassan Sani. Yeah. Uh, or Pia Aramukam, or Sokim Art, or James Wong. Yeah. Shows how old I am. 
<laughs> Last time in 1972, we qualified for the Munich Olympics. We qualified for the Munich Olympics finals. On the way to qualification, we beat Japan 3 nil. We beat South Korea 1 nil. We repeated the feat again in 1980. That time we beat South Korea 3-0 first time, second time we beat them 2-1. We beat them twice to prove that we are definitely better than them to qualify for Moscow Olympics. The last time we played South Korea, 1989, we lost 3-0 to work twice. And ever since then, we didn't qualify even to play South Korea. We will talk about playing South Korea. And for South Korea, we know have gone on to enter the semi-finals World Cup. They have qualified for World Cup, every single World Cup ever since then. And Malaysia can't even get out of Southeast Asia. Soccer was like that. Politics, same thing. South Korea today didn't achieve what they achieved without liberalizing their political landscape. Today, it is recognized as one of the most democratic, mature democratic systems in the entire world. But not too long ago, it was ruled by military dictators. And it's only after they start having a two-party system, where they change the opposition, opposition change back to government, that's when they really have their economy kick-starting. And today, South Korea has created history. In 2012, when they had their presidential elections, they elected the first female president of South Korea, Park Gwen Han. So they have broken the glass ceiling, even the political glass ceiling for our uh, women vote, today International Women's Day, that have been broken. In Malaysia, we also created history last year. What history did we create? We appointed the very first male women's minister of Malaysia. Dato Sri Najib People elected the first woman president, we appoint the first male woman minister. And that is how far we have become, and that's the type of joke that we have become internationally. What else? Being Women's Day today, I want to talk a bit about one of the issues that affect the people of Banda Utama, people of PJ the most. What? Crime. You lock up your whole taman. Like a war zone. To put it even crudely, you like live in a mini jail, a bit freer than jail, but almost like a jail. Did you do that willingly? Oh. Did you do that willingly? Oh. But BN doesn't see that. In Parliament, when I raise this issue on crime, the fact that people of PJ urban areas are forced are forced to set up barricades, are forced to set up barriers is because of fear of crime. You know what our BM MP tell us, Abdul Rahman Dalan, for the blood. You know what he said? Uh? He stood up and rebutted me. No, nah, where well, got dangerous? You people set up barriers, uh, barricades, uh, because you want exclusivity. You don't want the, the newspaper there to come in, talk, 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 surat kabar lama, surat kabar lama all the time. That's why you set up barricades. And that's the way BN looks at you. They really have no clue at all what you all go through to prevent crime from happening in these urban areas. They have no clue at all. And that's why until today, they think the fight against crime is not the fight against crime. It is fight against the perception of crime. They tell us, hey, all the statistics very nice. What? Oh, our crime has reduced by street crimes. Huh? Well, street crimes reduced by 40% you know, over the last two years. From 2009 to 2001, they reduced 40%. You know. Overall crime reduced by 15%. You know. Do you feel safer? No. Do you feel safer? No. For a long time, I'm not sure how to reply in Parliament. Because I don't have any other figures to prove the government otherwise. They give the figures, I can only take the figures at face value. When they say it's a perception issue, I got no hard data to reply. But then end of last year, a whistleblower came out and blew up an entirely whole new issue to discredit the figures given by the government. 
The government tells us crime has gone down. But in reality, what they tell us, index crime has gone down. The crime index has gone down. What we didn't know was that there was a crime index, there was also a non-index crime. I thought crime is crime. Huh? But now they have index crime and non-index crime. Now what is index crime and what is non-index crime? I also didn't know. So we tried to ask, we figure out along the way. Index crime is like this. Uh, I see any girl. I go there, I want to whack her up. Give me 200 bucks or I whack you. I take 200 bucks, I run. That is an index crime. Or I feel sir, I take out a knife. Nah. No? Give me 500 bucks or I kill you. Okay, I take 500 bucks, I run. That is an index crime. But if I have a weapon, the same knife, a pocket knife, put it in my pocket, I go to Ali, I say, give me 1,000 bucks. You give me, I take, I run, that is a non-index crime. <laughs> Many don't understand. <laughs> I also didn't before. <laughs> it is explained like this. Because there was a hidden weapon that was not used, the person is charged with intent to cause harm and not causing harm. So intent to cause harm is not very dangerous, so it is a non-index crime. So all these snatch thieves, okay, suddenly they found weapons on their body, maybe it's nail clipper or something like that, and then it's treated as non-index crime. What else? Better example, house breaking. Many of you face house breaking, but nobody keeps any valuables in your house anymore. I break into Kailun's house. <laughs> Four, one million ringgit in debt. Take and run. Index crime. Okay. I break into Eddie's girl's house. I forgot to look at her public declaration of assets. Her credit card all negative one. Can't not find anything. Cut up her sofa. Try to find jewelry there. Tear down her cupboard. Take out all her clothes. Break all her uh, cutleries in the in the kitchen. Cannot find anything at all. Turn the house upside down. I walk away empty-handed. Mommy next time. <laughs> So, over 2007 to 2011, 2007 to 2011, the official published data of the government's crime index dropped by 25%. Wow, very good. Oh. 2007 to 2011, index crime dropped by 25%. What they didn't tell you, and up to today, what they refuse to clarify is the non-index crime over the same period 2007 to 2011 went up by 69 percent now if you tell me crime really went down by right both to go down maybe one more than another i can accept that but when one go down by 25 percent the other one suddenly jump up by 69 percent you know that crime data is being manipulated by the police and even if crime has indeed gone down by a little bit, it is because people have to take security measures by their own. I remember when in 2008, when I stood for elections, very few barricades around. And because we won and because we closed one eye, everyone closed up their own gardens. And that would have contributed a huge deal to reducing crime in your area. That will have contributed a lot. People are forced to pay your own money for your own security guard, for your own protection, when this should be the responsibility of the police. And our Home Minister, our Home Minister, Dato Hishamuddin Hussein, proposed a budget in the last budget sitting of parliament for this year. It allocated 272 million. 272 million. And I tell you what the budget title says. 272 million to fight or reduce crime perception index. 272 million not to fight crime index or to lower crime index, but 272 million to lower crime perception index. To put it very simply, yeah. Very crudely, huh? 272 million to brainwash all of you into thinking you are very safe. 
This is how our government works. They refuse to solve the root of the problem. They try to solve the superficial level and then they tell you they have done a great job. No? If they can't cause the root of the problem to be solved, they cause at least the opinion to change, they can continue to be in power. So we have to put a stop to this. And I implore on the very intelligent, the very clever people of the Talib Jaya, Bandar Utama and the, all the urban areas, help us send this message home to the rural areas. We cannot win the general elections if we do not at least take one third of the parliamentary seats in Johor. We will not win the general elections unless we take at least one third of the seats in Sabah and Sarawak. There is no point Elizabeth winning in 30,000 majority and her opponent losing her deposit. <laughs> no point, still one don't see it. There is no point for me doubling my majority from 20,000 to 40,000. It is still one parliamentary seat. The battle is in the rural seats and it, it counts, I mean, it counts on all of you here to help us spread the message. Go to any one of our Facebook pages. DKR page, DAP page, PASS page, share the message, make sure the message goes out to everyone in the rural areas, however remote they can be. Then only we have a chance of success. Then only we can bring a better future for our children. Can we do that? Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah. I'm not sure what our spoke just now. I'll just very briefly close by touching a little bit on our manifesto. I would think that Rafizi will have touched on that, but I just want to tell everyone that we have calculated whatever that is in the manifesto very, very carefully. I just want to give one simple example on why we will not bankrupt the country if we implement our manifesto. Pakistan National will have you think that if we implement our manifesto today, tomorrow Malaysia becomes bankrupt. I'll tell you why they will become bankrupt based on their definition. You all use LDP outside? Yeah. You all pay 160 toll? Yeah. Look at LDP uh, when they built it. Uh, it's 1.327 billion if you want that exact number. 1.327 billion including capitalized interest, that is interest all taken in. Okay? Interest all already taken in. And yet in their prospectus document for their listing, uh, you know how much profits they estimate to make? And prospectors, you cannot simply hunt down profit while it's audited. Okay? How much did they expect to make over the 30-year concession? 18.8 billion ringgit. Net clean of tax everything. 18.8 billion ringgit, which means 47% return annually, guaranteed. 47% annually. And why is it that when Pakatan comes into power, we want to abolish the toll there or we want to take back the toll? Very simple. We cannot let the people suffer and let these concessionaires make astronomical profits. They does not make sense at all. <laughs> but for Barisan National, for Barisan National, the fate of these concessionaires is more important than the fate of all of you out here who are using the toll every day. Why? Because they say if we were to take over the toll, we must pay compensation in terms of future profit loss to the concessionaire. Now, if we have to pay their future profit in order to buy back the highway, but so that you'll continue paying for the next 20 years, huh? why give them the profit upfront? Does not make sense. But the end, when they take back highway, they pay future profits because they want to ensure that their cronies get maximum profits from every concessionaire. We have gone through the agreement, the concessionaire agreement. I personally have read the agreement. And the clause of compensation in this agreement is very clear. We only need to pay for the cost of the construction of the highway. We do not need to pay a single cent of future profit compensation section to this concessionaire. Nonsense. We need to compensate for their previous years to make sure they have at least 12% return a year. But they have got more than 12% return a year, which means we have, don't have to compensate even for their previous year. So we really only need to pay for the cost of the highway. And Malaysia can afford 1.327 billion to buy back Lebo Raya Damansara Bucho. We do not need to pay 10.30 billion for Lebo Raya 
Samantara Buto. And it is the same applied across all the highways and all the private concessionaires. And that is why when we say it will only cost us gradually over the five year period approximately 40 billion ringgit to take over all the, all the highways that are charging astronomical fees. They say no, it will cost hundreds and hundreds of billions of ringgit because they are only interested in profiting these concessionaires. So we have calculated how much is the budget of the country a year? 250 billion ringgit. 10% of that, 25 billion ringgit. You tell us we cannot afford 1 billion to take back one highway. Can? There are worse highways around. Max Expressway, you all take the max to the airport sometimes, right? You all take the max to the airport, right? It was built for 1.3 billion ringgit as well. But to build the 1.3 billion ringgit, the government gave a grant of 960 million ringgit. Does it make sense? Huh? You privatize because government no money to build. So you privatize, let the private sector deal, let them clap toll. But in this case, the cost was 1.3 billion ringgit, the government paid 960 million ringgit. If you can pay 960 million ringgit, why must you still privatize the highway? Collect the toll yourself to take back the 300, 300 million ringgit, also never mind. But they privatize the entire highway to Tan Sri Abu Sayyid. And now Tan Sri Abu Sayyid wants to sell the highway for 1.7 billion ringgit. They don't have to pay back the grant, huh? So because he paid, he took a grant of 960 million ringgit from the government, he took a loan of 300 million ringgit from the bank, he only invested 60 million ringgit from this exercise, his 60 million ringgit over 5 years gave him 1 billion ringgit profit. This is the way our Operation National Government works. So based on the contract, now we go by the contract, concessionaire contract, the one, the contract that Tan Sri Abu Sayyid signed himself to buy back the highway cost us just 300 million ringgit. We cannot afford 300 million ringgit to dispense of toll for the next 27 years. Uh. We can. We can more than afford that. So, what else? Free education, which I'm sure Rafizi talked about. How much does it cost? 700 million ringgit. We cannot afford that. We can. Lower taxes for the for the cars. Can we afford that? How much will it cost? Seven billion ringgit. We do it over five years. Every year is one point four billion ringgit. If we openly auction APs instead of letting all the cronies make all the profit from the APs, we collect one point five billion ringgit a year. More than enough to compensate for lower taxes for cars, so that all nations will have lower burden. to say that if we are able to ruin Putrajaya, we would actually be able to create more savings, more savings than what was projected in the manifesto and we can return more goodies to the people. We have done that for Slango, we have done that for Penang. As YB Sivrasa just now said, our reserves went up despite dishing out goodies everywhere. When we first gave water subsidies, all the BN people said, if we give free water, Slango bankrupt. But instead of bankrupting, our reserves went up. Same thing for Penang. Last time when we came in, 400 million expenditure. Today we have 1.1 billion in expenditure, and yet every year we achieve record surpluses. How do we do that? Because we are not corrupt. Because we don't take the people's money. Because we don't waste the people's money on crony projects that doesn't bring any return to the people. Because we make sure that every asset of the government is standard openly to achieve maximum value, maximum revenue for us to return every single cent to the people. We, Pakatan Rakyat, can rule Malaysia much, much, much better than Barisan National. And we hope, we hope for the sake of our children, come next general election, the people will show the we will rule in Putrajaya. We will bring a better future for all Malaysians. Thank you. Thank you very much.